Is there, where's there a good summary of what the hell happened in the keynote? I'm more in your notes. God damn it, John. I didn't take good <laughs> notes. What do you want from me? <laughs> oh, you guys are the best. So we are here live uh, in California, almost on vacation. We uh, are in my hotel room, so any weird audio things that might or might not be here, that's uh, the Park 55's fault, definitely not ours. Yeah, so we, we just got out of the State of the Union, and uh, so I guess there's a lot to cover here. I don't know how much we're going to get to today because we have a bit of a time limit, uh, so let's just try to get started, huh? Right. So uh, what was the first thing that was covered in the keynote? Was it... Uh, I don't even... I, it was all a blur. Let me watch see OS. I, watch OS. It was, was Watch OS. That's yes, right. Yes, watch yes. OS. All right. Watch OS 3. Holy crap. It, it, it turns out that Watch OS 3 is actually the first non-beta version of Watch OS, in my personal opinion. Man, did it look good. Well, we haven't used it yet, so it, we don't I know. Said, look, I said look good. I <laughs> yeah. didn't say it was good. Yeah, but honestly, no, I mean, I... I mean, you know, I'm kind of a watch skeptic at this point. Are you? Uh, but a little bit. But uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I think it looks great. And I was really, really hoping that they would, you know, kind of just re- rethink the watch, rethink the app paradigm, rethink the, um, the the difference between the glances and the app and and everything else. And I think they did. And it looks really good. I'm very tentatively optimistic about it, honestly. I, I think it shows that they are... Like, you know, by getting rid of the glances and by consolidating, uh, you know, the app with the face and everything, it looks like they are actually willing to reconsider and rethink fundamental things about how the watch works. And that yep. is awesome. And because, because, you know, it kind of needed that, you know, ov- the, I think the overall, the overall impression that, that I think we're getting from Apple f- for about the watch during this is please use apps. Like that's kind of like you know. First of all, please make apps for, it. and then secondly, like they are they are being much more forward with users, including things like the like the the complication like gallery they showed off in the, at the end of the State of the Union. There, um, they're being more forward with users about like how 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 they discover that that they can put apps on their watch, and by making the apps better, hopefully they'll make them a little more you know sticky and useful for people so overall it looks great and i really hope that it ends up performing and just being as good as it looks in the keynote yeah as the one of the three of us that i think is most enthusiastic about the watch i was overjoyed by what i saw i it looked unbelievable Uh, apple apparently has made tremendous strides on making app launching considerably quicker um as far as we know all of that is software it doesn't require any new watch hardware which presumably is coming sometime soon but no formal mention was made of it uh it looked awesome and there were some other features that i thought were really good uh the the emergency thing that they did so if you mash down on what was once the completely useless contacts button but is now the like what is that the glances button or not glances but like the app it's like the app the dock, the dock, dock button right yes, right, right. Yeah, yeah. dock so anyway so you mash down on the dock button and it shows you what today is the three sliders, which is power off, power reserve, and lock device. Well, if you hold down on the button long enough, it will eventually place an emergency call to the local emergency number in the particular locality that you're stand or sitting in. And so if you're in Hong Kong with, and you have an American watch, it will call whatever the appropriate number is in Hong Kong. If you're in America, regardless, if your watch happens to be British, it will call 911. It's very, very cool. And it will also, I guess, pay or send a push notification to uh, emergency contacts with your location and, and I guess whereabouts or whatever. It looked really, really cool. Yeah, this is, I mean... I, I I worry a little bit about how easy it is to invoke, like, if you just hold down the button, because it is fairly, you know, it's not that uncommon mm-hmm. to accidentally hold down a button on your watch if it's, like, pressing against something. So to have an action that re- that only requires it to be held down for a long time with no additional confirmation step, uh, I think there's there's a bit of a risk of false alarms there. But overall, the, the idea of this feature is really nice. Um, you know, implementation details aside, the, the idea of it is great. And it's yet one more reason why some people might want the watch, yet one more benefit some people might get from it. I don't expect this to be extremely widely used, but for the people who do use it, it'll make a really big difference in their life. And that's that's nothing to, uh, to sneeze at. I think you can't make it too complicated, though. Like because right. if you're in a situation and all, like you can't make that, you can't really make it be an interaction. You can't really make it so. Okay, well, to call nine one one, do this, then look at your watch, then place your finger precisely to touch this thing, then do that, then you know, like confirm and double confirm and insert both keys. It really has to be the 
all I can do in this injured state is grow up for my watch, feel a physical button, and hold it down for a really long time. And even that may be beyond the the, the physical abilities of someone who's in a real dire emergency. Um, I mean, a, a more clever, well, I don't know if more clever, a, an even more prone to false alarms implementation would be uh, if it notices like your heart rate going down to unsafe levels or something. But then again, some people have really low heart rates and I don't know, what the, <laughs> you know, like you're trying to make it sort of the, uh, this watch uh, is actively monitoring whether this person is alive and healthy, and when they're not, it sends notifications. I don't have to call nine one one, but at least sending their their uh, location out to uh, their emergency contact or whatever. I mean, overall, for all the the watch three things, it, I don't want to be mean to Apple, but it kind of makes me wonder. Like the yeah, watch has been in development for a long time, and they launched it with one of only two physical buttons on the device being a feature that basically nobody used. And they fixed that in watch OS three. Great. Good. Kudos. Bro. We're all talking about this is, you know, they've consolidated things and they've, I think that was one of the biggest applause lines when people realized that they repurposed that huge button on the side <laughs> yep. to something that people lose. I'm like, when you were testing it internally, did you have testers bias where you were so enamored with the idea of contacting the other five people on the watch OS team and sending them scribbles or whatever, like that, that, that you convinced yourself that that is actually, such an important feature that it deserved this big button. I think it, it reveals a a flaw in their testing group or methodology or some other bias that they that they missed this. And it's also a shame because of Apple's release cycles that they kind of had to wait for an entire year for them to fix this because it required a big rethink. Like I, I feel like almost all the things that they're revamping here, with the exception of the tech stuff of making it launch faster, but almost all the other revampings seem like things they could have discovered with a with a broader test group. Uh, when they were coming up with the first design and the rest of the stuff like making it launch faster that's it's not really making it launch faster it's making it be already launched (laughs) it can be already there keep keep more stuff in memory so you don't have to launch it because you're never going to be able to launch it fast in this slow hardware Um, that that seems like a good rethinking i've heard uh some people uh say that it's actually still not quite streamlined enough and that you could streamline it further so that you could control the entire watch with just the physical buttons for example when your fingers are sweaty the sweaty finger people are very angry like the, the idea, <laughs> the idea that, that, that trying to use your watch at a certain point your finger becomes useless because it's got it's too too sweaty right and so they want to be able to quickly hit physical buttons to stop and start a timer on their workout and stuff in situations where their finger cannot precisely interact with the screen in any way so i think there's still ways to go in terms of accessibility for can i use the watch like a regular watch without touching the screen at all I'm not sure that's a use case that Apple cares about at this point, but definitely watchOS 3 is a huge step in the right direction on all fronts, especially if it performs the way they showed, and especially if whatever hit there is to battery life is not noticeable. Because one thing I think people have mostly not been complaining about is that my watch dies in the middle of the day, so maybe they have a little bit of battery to spare, maybe they can squish things down, and there'll be enough overhead for all these background updates and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I mean, the watch battery is a bit of a problem for the 38 millimeter users who use workout mm, mode a lot. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, then generally you're right. I mean, most. I mean, when I was wearing the watch, I would finish most days with like 50 percent battery left, which is great. But you weren't using any apps on the watch. Like that's I, that's I, true. To yeah. see how this works out in practice, it's like uh, if you know because the apps were so cumbersome to use, you wouldn't use it for that. And so now, if they become better to use, I don't know. That, their whole the whole push is that we want people to be in and out of the app quickly, small, quick interactions, and your interactions can't be quick if you can't start them until uh you know three ten seconds past they also were talking about how the current app won't go away for a much longer period of time so if you're in the store looking at a shopping list every time you bring the you know you look at the shopping list you somehow navigate to it and you check off the item you just got and then you put your arm down you walk 20 feet in the aisle pick up another item pick up your watch again it's like i have no idea what you were just looking at here's the time (laughs) like i was just looking at the grocery list find the grocery list again even if it's as simple as like hit the button swipe swipe to the dock go back into the it will remember oh you were just looking at your grocery list and stick on that and this is kind of like a mind reading thing where when you want it to be on the last thing you were looking at you're frustrated that it's not but if you just want it to show the time you're frustrated that it's showing the previous watch so this is another delicate balance and i hope they sort of user tested this more uh in the real world maybe now that the watch is public they could they could have been all wearing it maybe that was the flaw in the methodology if you try to wear it secretly <laughs> right. with a small group of people you're not going to learn like because it's so easy to convince yourself that little wheel of people is like super awesome and you could send each other <laughs> like digital touches and stuff and then once it's out in the wide world, you're like, you know what? I don't find myself <laughs> using the wheel of people that often. We have this whole big button. Let's use it or something else. But but kudos to them for not being stubborn and saying, 
you know, they, they didn't come up with the right paradigm the first time. So let's try again. Instead of trying to just let me just do minor tweaks and maybe we can adjust them. Be- it's as if they changed the purpose of the home button on iOS. Like, <laughs> yeah, like basically. it used to be when you push the home button, you went back to the big grid of icons. But we turned out that's totally wrong and we're going to use it for something else. <laughs> they got that right the first time on the phone. They did not get it right on the watch. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably move on from the watch pretty soon. But a couple of other notes. Um, a lot more support for people who are wheelchair bound, which I thought was really, really cool. That was great. Um, yeah. And among other things, the stand notification now says time to roll, take a break and push around for uh, one minute. I thought that was really awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I can imagine if I was in a wheelchair, I would think that's amazing and, and certainly more inclusive. Um, they did a lot. Well, mm, they sort of did a lot with faces. So there's different faces, newer faces, more customizable faces. Yet, unless I'm missing something, you can't as a third-party developer, make your own face. It's just the complications are a little bit more robust now. Is that kind of a fair summary? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, yeah, you you have basically no ability to make faces at all, but complications suck less. You know, before, <laughs> before like, it, th- one of the reasons why we haven't seen, you know, an incredibly useful complications from developers is that there's been all sorts of limitations in place. And honestly, mm-hmm. Underscore is way better to, you know, qualified to talk about this than I am because I, because basically I, from what he told me, I, I, do, I discovered there was nothing for me to do there really uh, before. Uh, you know, think just things like, you know, how often can the complication update its own data from its app uh, versus just try to guess from like a timeline what it should be discovering and stuff like that. So with this release, some of those limitations have been lifted. And yeah, I mean, they haven't been removed. They've just, you know, maybe like the limits have been raised um, or some some new things are possible that were impossible before in a complication. But it seems like the, the major advantage that uh, that watch apps have is that kind of unified glance slash app mode and if you're configured as a complication, you you could, you're more frequently kept in memory or something. I don't know the details, but like you have higher privileges in the system, and you're refreshed more often, and you you can you know you can respond faster because you're kept more in memory. So, you know, for people who who want to configure one or two apps as their complications, those apps will be substantially faster to respond uh, than the other ones in the system. But we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. And all the apps will have background refresh, so that the, the big uh, slam on the other uh, on the old watch was that a lot of the times when you went to anything, any kind of screen, very often you saw old information. And by yeah. going to the screen, you triggered, okay, now this application gets to do something to update its information. And again, that kills the whole get in, get out, quick nature of the watch. The new system is background refresh or all apps privilege for i think it's for all apps definitely privileged uh, if it's a if it's a complication and the little demo they gave was update all of your ui so it always matches so that you're never in a situation where the glance shows one thing but if you launch the app it showed something else but if you you know uh, saw in the complication it shows a third thing that just keep them all in sync all always up to date and in the old uh regime of watch os 2 you couldn't do that because you weren't running until they activated you and by then it was too late because you should was supposed to already have the information so They've learned that lesson. They've implemented, hopefully, in a way that, again, doesn't kill your battery and, and sorts out the limited memory on the watch in a way that actually enables the applications you use frequently to be all up-to-date, all consistent. Yeah, and it all looked really, really good. It was funny that they actually showed a demonstration of watchOS 2 and how crappy it is to load an app <laughs> on watchOS 2. And it was Kevin Lynch, I believe, was basically yeah. said in so many words, look at how crappy this is, you guys. But yeah. don't worry, we fixed it, so it's all good. Yeah, well, Apple's Apple's willing to to critique their own past work once the problems go away and yeah, their I was new about work. To say, right. yeah, like, once the problem's yeah. gone, then it's, we're cool. It isn't how crappy this is, it's look how crappy this was. Right. Yeah, and actually, now we that's a very good point. It. You're right. Uh, a couple of quick other uh, watch highlights. Um, Scribble, I think they called it, so you can actually do handwriting on the watch, mm-hmm. and that'll turn into text. I don't think that's going to be terribly convenient. However... I do applaud the fact the the fact that it's a possibility that it's something you can do because sometimes you maybe don't want to dictate and maybe you only want to write one word like the example on the uh, Apple website that goes through all the different stuff on the watch is the word Starbucks like you're not going to want to you're not mm. you may not want to dictate that ne- necessarily but at least you can scribble out S T A R B and it would hopefully figure out oh, what yeah. you want I would there. I would never want to be be heard saying the word Starbucks naturally I'd not. be too embarrassed this, this feels more like an accessibility feature for people who have difficulty speaking to it because i can't think of a situation where i mean you can whisper to the watch bring it right up to your face and say starbucks (laughs) (laughs) you whisper it it's like a prayer (laughs) like like, but because scratching out those letters graffiti style it's not graffiti you can actually write actual letters on the little watch face especially if you have the small watch oh boy that does not sound like a good time and dictation for people who haven't tried it dictating on the watch like dictating anywhere if you're afraid to be talking to your devices just do it a few times till you realize wow this is faster than i could type on a keyboard because it usually is for most people 
it's really efficient. Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice that they added it there as an option, and that's definitely a kind of a watch OS three feature. Like, hey, we'll throw it in. We can do it. Maybe it'll be good. Maybe it'll be bad. Maybe a few people use it in certain situations, but why not? Certainly, it's not sucking your battery up. It's an input mode, and uh, yeah, it's better than it's better than digital doodles to each other. It's, oh yeah, you know. So and yeah. it also uh, supports Chinese, which um, yeah, I, that's from, a big feature. That was which, cool. is, which is really impressive. And uh, actually, that's a great mini segue. There were. A handful of people of color on stage. There were a handful of women on stage. Mm -hmm. And I thought every single one of the people of color and women on stage absolutely killed it. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more later about um, the woman whose name escapes me that did the music demo, who I thought was fantastic. Um, And the woman who did the uh, scribble, the the Chinese um, scribble demo. Mm -hmm. I, I... I could have practiced that character, a couple of characters, for six weeks and would have screwed it yeah, up. Yeah, that's difficult. The amount of space. I mean, it looks so big up on the screen. Oh, it's drawing a Chinese character. Then, but think of like some of those strokes were so small. Oh, yeah. On like the finger must have been covering the entire thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know enough about uh, Far East text input to know how important it is to be able to do this on the watch. Like, is dictation worse in uh, in Chinese or Japanese or other languages like that? Because I don't know. It, it, you know, it still seems like it would be faster to dictate, but certainly. Uh, drawing out characters uh, or he's like you know selecting radicals or whatever and combining into characters like when you have languages that don't just have 26 letters it's mm-hmm. a, it's a big feature well and also like you know it, when you have a language like that where the the density of like how many characters you need to express the message that you're yeah, trying to shorter. send when you have like you know only a handful of characters versus like you know having us type out five words mm-hmm. um, I think it's more compelling because it, it's mm-hmm. it's you know less time mm-hmm. to input this thing on this on this very on this device that has very limited input capabilities but you know overall I think the the doodling of characters Characters is it's the kind of thing where like it's going to be one of those fine balances where it has to be a very short thing you're trying to doodle and it has to be way faster than doing it on, than taking out your phone and just doing it there yeah. and like it's only you know if it's all so it's all down to like the implementation and the context in which you're doing these things if it's going to be a big pain like the first few times you do it you're probably just gonna say all right i'm just gonna take out my phone from now on to do this right. this thing so it has to be really good and you know, it's it's probably not going to be that widely used, but it'll be nice for the for occasional use. I think. Oh, yeah, I'm getting back to the diversity topic. Like, yeah, we come with this before. This, there's only so much Apple can do here because they're the high level, C level executives. The people on their like important people page are mostly all white guys, right? Um, and you have to wait for them to die or retire to be replaced until you can fix your diversity problem at the top, right? You know, like you're, you, that. That's just a problem they face from years and years of of. Uh, not paying enough attention to this topic so they're fixing it in presentations the best they can they still have you know craig federighi and eddie q and uh, like everyone else up there like doing it and, and tim cook and like the whole the people who are really really in charge at the very top but right below them the people who do the demos there's no reason that those have to be a bunch of people who look at, at, at exactly like them right and so they're doing they're doing a good job they're doing it and it's amazing like they could have done this many years ago but it's taken a long time for them to realize you know, like the first time they did it, be like, we'll have one woman presenter. It's like, mm, keep trying. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, well, okay, we'll have two women presenters, but both white. Good, keep making progress. It's like they're they're slowly working their way up to it. And 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 like you said, all the presenters were great. And of course, like you know, all they're going to be great because again, these aren't just like random people they picked out of Apple employees. If you look at their titles, they're in charge of or intimately involved with the products they're presenting. They're not like random drop-in mm-hmm. people they they know their stuff they're enthusiastic about it and like everyone else on stage they rehearse the hell out of them and mm-hmm. so, so everybody's good uh so that was nice to see it's like i said it's still, it's still going to be years and years before uh you see that at the very top but i hope all presentations are like this should be like the minimum bar now yeah. for right, below, exactly. below the top level they should all be like this and quality wise as well because yeah yeah, I thought I thought it actually added to the quality of the presentation as a whole to hear different voices, and and because these these people were like you said so freaking good at doing these presentations. I mean, these uh, a handful of these people were the first time I'd seen them on stage, right. and, and they're they, better than Craig's first time. Right? Oh God, yeah. Now to be fair, I freaking love Craig now. <laughs> they're but, better than Eddie Q now. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's <laughs> well, true. Poor Eddie, come on, let's not be mean. There. So, so I love photos. I can't wait to do it. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so that's Watch OS, uh, and I think the best summary of the Watch OS part of the keynote, which up until the State of the Union was the my favorite thing I'd seen so far today. Uh, but the the summary page for or the the preview page for Watch OS, which I uh, mentioned briefly earlier, it says at the top of the screen, Watch OS feels like a whole new watch, which is kind of uncomfortable that they're like, hey, well, this old stuff was crap. But hey, we, we fixed it. We're cool. <laughs> we're, we're all good, right? But it's true. I mean, I'm really, really, ex- I'm really excited about um, 
about where this is going. And the watch looks really great. We are sponsored this week by Fracture. Fracture is a company that prints photos directly onto glass. Go to FractureMe.com and you can get 10% off with the code ATP10. Now, Fracture, these photos are amazing looking. These nice, thin pieces of glass with your photos printed in vivid color. The colors pop like you won't believe, and it comes in the solid foam core backing behind the glass, so you can mount it really easily on walls, or you can stand it up on desks with little desk stands. They make it so easy to use these prints, and they just look fantastic. I get compliments on my Fracture prints all the time because they're all over our house. They make your photos look good. If you want to get your photo printed, and you, you know what, you probably should. So often your photos just kind of sit on your phone forever, or the, you, know, you, post, you post them to Facebook or Instagram, and they're there for like a day, and then they're just buried forever, and no one ever sees them again. With Fracture, you can get your photos printed and have this physical artifact, have an actual physical representation of your photo that is an object that's made to last, and it just looks fantastic. You don't need to frame them. They are their own thing. You know, they're, all, they're their own self-contained thing. So it looks great. The value is amazing for the, you know, for the price. They make fantastic gifts. You can give them as gifts for holidays, or if, you're like, if you go on a trip with somebody, you can you know, send them a gift of some photos from the trip on Fractures. Uh, you can send them to family. If you, have like, you, know, if you want to like send pictures of your kids to their grandparents or something else like that, you can do that. Fractures just make great gifts and great prints. I like Fracture a lot. I use them myself. There, if I if I need photos printed, I just go to them. It's simple as that, uh, and I I recommend you do the same. Now, Fracture is partnering with Big Green Egg to give away a Big Green Egg Minimax for Father's Day. All you need to do to enter is visit eggmydad.com and share your favorite dad quote or dad joke or dadism to enter. Check it out today. Go to FractureMe.com and use code ATP10 to get 10% off. Thanks a lot. So next, tvOS. Uh, the only thing I really got from that that I was really excited about there were two things actually. One, dark mode, which, yes. is, a, which is something I didn't even know I wanted. But now that well, I as soon I as I, it. <laughs> I know you did, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really good. And uh, supposedly single sign on, which supposedly will fix all those problems. That, that'll be awesome too. So dark mode. Uh, I've noticed recently that some tvOS apps have been implementing their own dark mode. Like they've been responding, I guess, assuming user requests for it. And like, why? Why do people care about dark mode? I, it's not just aesthetics, but you know, aesthetics is one thing. Just ask Marco. People sometimes like dark mode for their applications. Second thing is people watch television in darkened rooms sometimes. And if your UI has a white background and you come out of any kind of video which usually doesn't have a white background, it can be extremely sort of shocking and glaring. And this is not why they did it. But for me specifically, I have a plasma TV and pure white on a plasma TV draws a lot of extra power and can make your transformers whine a little bit and it's the situation it's a that again this is not why they did it but i'm excited by it and also because i watch tv uh, in a, a semi semi darkened room at night so I, it kind of boggles my mind that they decided to go with white for their tv ui because they know people watch tv in kind of darkened rooms and you, you know when the show is over and you hit the menu button you don't want your eyeballs blown out especially since non-plasma tvs have incredible brightness like uh, led tvs can go super super bright and sometimes people haven't turned up that bright so they can see them in bright sunlight it's just not a good plan and the single sign-on is the other major pain point for like you know when you install applications you got to go through this little dance and go to a website and type in these codes and i think that stops regular people from installing too many apps because it's a pain in the butt if there is a single sign-on that you can do once and handles all of that for you and people implement it, which I'm sure they will because people want you to install their apps, this will be great. So two thumbs up. Yeah, it seems, I mean, the single sign-on, I don't honestly, you know, because I don't have cable and, you know, I'm probably never going <laughs> to see this myself. But uh, the, the dark mode, just going back to that for a second, you know, there, we, we saw like with, the, with watchOS, with the updates, it seems like watchOS is getting like a major course correction. And with iOS, which we'll get to in a little bit, I'm sure, uh, it seems like the design language has been updated to some degree as somewhat of a course correction, somewhat just, you know, refreshing things, making things new. You know, things like, you know, buttons are now more visible as buttons, and, and some of the text is a little bit thicker to be more legible and stuff. The, the TV getting dark mode, I wonder if that is kind of like a, uh, like a half step in a course correction where, like, you know, the previous Apple TV was all constantly dark background. Uh, you know, most other TV boxes do dark background because, you know, all the reasons you said it basically works better for TVs, the way TVs are actually used and TV hardware and everything. The new Apple TV getting this all white theme up front, honestly, I consider that a design misstep. And I think, you know, they should have, like, instead of just offering dark mode, 
they should just make TVOS 10 or whatever it's going to be called, just make it dark. Like, right. just retheme the whole OS to be dark because most of the other design elements don't have to change. That's one of the reasons they're able to offer a dark mode without a whole ton of work. Like, almost all the rest of the design works, whether it's a light or dark background. So, why not course correct all the way and just retheme TVOS to be dark and not have this weird setting and have to, you know, have everybody dual design their apps? Yeah, part of the reason the light mode, that they chose light mode, is it did it was a differentiator. Because like you said, every other mm-hmm. TV box was a, like a blackish background with stuff on it, and Apple was different. Uh, different in a bad way in this case, but it is differentiated <laughs> in the market. So it seems like they don't want to give that. Even their dark mode is not black like the old Apple TV. It looks like it's dark gray. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, this is not the things that are most wrong with TVOS are mostly involved inside the applications themselves. How do I navigate? How is it presented? And that's not an OS level problem. That's like a problem of how do you implement the your app for showing TV shows and movies and individual apps can fix that. Apple's may still be not particularly convenient to use, but the Netflix app or whatever can continue to make a pleasant experience within the framework that's provided. Yeah, the other uh, thing that's worth bringing up with regard to the TV is the new remote app that was it Q promised like three months ago. Yeah, when he was when he was on the the talk show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It was on the talk show, wasn't it? Um, that's uh, here now. And to be honest, I don't really see why yeah, that's for people totally who play games. But they can have multiple controllers because you can use any any iOS devices controller. That was the other big announcement in the, in the State of the Union that uh, TVOS games can finally require a real controller. Yep. Uh, again, a, a misstep that seems. Remember, there was the bouncing back and forth when the thing was yep. released about the copy. But this is, I don't know how you can come to that decision and not realize the implications. It's not like anything has changed radically in the market since then. They've just like heard the cries of everybody else. And those same <laughs> cries, like if you just got any five developers into the room and said, uh, you know, you can write games for Apple TV. Oh, but you have to you, you have to make them usable on this terrible little remote. It's like, seriously? No, you have to. Why? Because we want everyone to be able to play them. Well, then there's certain kinds of games we just can't make. Well, try harder. And then, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it's... They still seem weird about games. Apple's always weird about games. This is a step in the right direction. Um, those controllers are still super expensive, and they showed. You know, we have support for four controllers. A family that buy, buys four controllers plus the price of an Apple. Four controllers cost like what? Twice as much as an Apple TV? Yeah, because aren't they like? Aren't they still like forty or fifty bucks yeah. each? I don't I know. I thought it was at least fifty, They're, but I'm think, not sure. Yeah. Their gaming story is still muddled as compared to the consoles, but. Uh, but you know, time marches on. I mean, you know, console controllers aren't cheap either. But but you know, overall, yeah, like you're getting, you're, you're definitely getting into console price territory if you're planning on buying four controllers. Right. Yeah. But I think if that ends up working out, like if we get cool multiplayer games, that could be really great. Like that could be an yeah. awesome thing for the platform. If they cared, they'd make a first party controller. But I dread them doing well, that based on the design of their first party remote. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, uh, yeah, that was TVOS, and, uh, I mean, I think it looks good. I, we really should uh, have Joe Steele on or something like that to see if he's happy. But, to me, it looked good, but uh, we'll see what happens. After TVOS was iOS 10. Um, so, when I said iOS, I really meant OS 10, uh, which isn't OS 10 <laughs> anymore. Yeah, I like, I like the beginning. They had Tim Cook come out and say, we have four platforms, and listed them off, and they didn't do the rename then, mm-hmm. you know, like they... It was a weird kind of, I don't know how they arranged the presentation, if that was an intentional tease or they just realized, oh, at this point, we can't tell them it's Mac OS. So Craig got to come out and do his renaming slide that he's done for the past few, like picking place names in California. Only this time it was about changing it to lowercase m Mac OS, uh, Casey's favorite name. <laughs> um, yeah, that was fine. We expected it. Uh, what did they talk about? Well, I will say, Mac? though, I, I did kind of expect them to just go with Mac OS 12. I didn't expect the California names to continue. Oh, no, I totally expected that. There's so oh, many yeah, places I, in I California. It it's such a great branding because they ran out of cats. Cats were a good branding, too, but they ran out. But they won't <laughs> run out of uh, place names in California. And, right, and, right. I think, and I think the place names are better than years, and they're better than numbers. By the way, the version is 1012, so yeah. not that it matters anymore. But And also, Sierra is a way better name than freaking El Capitan, which I still hate all well, this time later. that time is over now. Now. Yep, but, thank yep. goodness. Sierra is a good name. So in macOS Sierra, uh, there is a Siri, which looked very powerful. And toward the end of the Siri demo, it appeared as though it was doing a very Google Photos style, like, show me the files that involve, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good ex- whatever example they use, but you know, show me the files about the party I'm throwing. No, show me the ones I worked on with Aaron or something, you know, something along those yeah. lines where you're, where you're refining a search query, but being 
fairly abstract. Well, I mean, it's kind of abstract, right? Show me the files about the about the party we're planning, you know, or something along those lines. And it was able to piece together what that meant. Know the ones that I worked on with Aaron, and then bring down a shorter list. I didn't like that it was very. Um, Goofy in the initial response. Oh, God. Yeah, I, was I, trying, I was trying to be funny, be like, "Here's your say? files. You're a master filer. I love yeah. the way you work." Like, yeah, the whole like Siri like being being like what it thinks is funny and clever. Like, they, yeah. they I think that time but, is over. I think we need to drop that. Oh, no, there's a place for that, but it's not when you're in the middle of an interaction and narrowing searches. Like, and the fact that everything was in like notification center was weird, and they have another mechanism for save searches. And speaking of the photo stuff, a lot of the features that we're going to talk about in the context of iOS, I think it's pretty clear now that they're also available on the Mac. Like. Mm-hmm the photos and the deep learning and the blah 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 a lot of those are like oh and also on photos on the mac which is great like but they just didn't demo it in the context of the mac you know back back in the days for ios all of these features would have been demoed like here's you know face detection for example and it was shown in iphoto it was, it was shown on the mac in iphoto all the stuff here with face detection and stuff i assume is all of it better all be available on the mac but they didn't demo it in that context so surely siri would fit in with that but really it seemed like the, the new impressive features of Siri were mostly reserved to be shown in connection with iOS. I'm assuming some of them are on the Mac, but the fact that Siri exists on the Mac is good. The UI and having stuff in Notification Center, maybe not so good. And the, my, my hoped unification of Spotlight and Siri doesn't seem to be in the cards. They still seem to be separate things, which seems silly to me. Yeah, yeah. and I, I do kind of, like, it, it kind of bothers me how Notification Center is kind of like the junk drawer on OS X of, like, where yep. they shove mm-hmm. new features that, like... That most of which come from iOS, uh, and the way they do that, they, the way they do that is just by like having this iOS like drawer yeah, on it's the like side. A, it's like an iOS simula- simulator that's hiding yeah. off the right <laughs> end of the screen in this yeah. tall skinny mode. Like I do wish there was like a little bit, you know, maybe more more native seeming or more you know more integrated, um, you know, in- integration of these features. But you know, I, I guess you know, well, th- that'll work itself out over time as they as they you know work through these designs and as they see how these features are used, but. Yeah, overall, uh, it looks pretty cool. Uh, I do think, though, I I will go back and say, like, I think th- there, I think the room for Siri to have any kind of personality or wit, uh, I think that's over because that gets old. First of all, that it doesn't translate well to a lot of different cultures you, you, and people. You want to have that wit when you're conversing with it in a funny way, not when not when you've started doing a task. I, I think I think it gets old after like five seconds, and then and once you're past that point, like you don't want to hear, you don't want your your computer to be witty. Like when you type in commands in the command line, do you get witty responses from Bash? Sometimes, no, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I like it occasionally, but the problem is there's no way to tell when I'm going to receive it and think, oh, that's that's really cute, and when I'm gonna see. Your filing is styling. Like, come on, really? Yeah, well, they don't like, have they don't have the personalization stuff down. Like the the whole thing we were talking about with Google is like it should learn my preferences. If you love the thing to be funny, the, for those people it should be funny. For the people who don't <laughs> like it to be funny, it should learn that that it doesn't want them. You know that that is not even in the cards in terms of a uh, personalized uh, interaction with Siri. That it will learn from what you do and how you interact with it what it is you like and don't like, and that they need to get on that. It also like it's kind of no good if it's being funny and also not doing what you wanted. Yeah, that's the worst. So like then you really yep. hate it. You're like, yep. why are you being funny? You just failed at what I asked you to right. do. Yep. So like it, it just it doesn't. <laughs> here, in are some, practice. here are some websites I found for why are you being funny. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I can search the web for that if you'd like. I mean, yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah, like it, it has to like. I just think there the chances of that not being annoying uh, are so low that yeah. <laughs> they should just not do it. We forgot that's that. Fair. We forgot the tabs and windows or windows and tabs. Oh, yeah. no, we forgot a bunch of things, actually. So yeah. going back, um, the unlocking the Mac with watch, watch proximity, mm-hmm. really dig it. Or in touch, principle. A, touch ID on the keyboard of your Mac, just saying. Yeah, maybe. You never know. <laughs> uh, I really dig the proximity thing. What I want to see, though, is how is corporate IT going to like that sort of thing? Yeah. I suspect that anyone who has a job that has more than just a few people at it will probably have the kibosh put on that immediately, or kibosh, however you pronounce that stupid word. Um, do yeah, they, I got do, a lot of flack about that. Honest you know. question. Like, do, do companies that have that kind of strict security requirement often use Macs? Uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah. my company issued me a 15-inch MacBook Pro and issues a lot of developers 15-inch MacBook Pros. And the VPN software we use, which is Checkpoint VPN, also includes an on-device firewall that prevents all sorts of crap, yep. like AirDrop. Why is AirDrop 
<laughs> filtered by my <laughs> by my on I mean, device it, uh, VPN. It doesn't even have to be a secure company. As soon as you have an IT department, they want exactly. to lock all that stuff down. Exactly. And it's, yeah. it's annoying. So so I, you know I don't run the VPN on this computer unless I actually like it's not even installed unless I need to do something for work involving the VPN. When I will and then I will install it, do my work, and uninstall the VPN because it's that much of a nightmare. Uh, but anyway, I really like the idea of unlocking the the watch by proximity. Really dig it. Um, Universal clipboard. I love this. This mm. looks amazing. Universal clipboard looks like a good idea, but as someone who uses the clipboard to store lots of crap, I saw it as a potential for data loss. Where some uh, until I get into the right mindset, I don't have the idea that copying something on my phone will squish what's on my Mac. Now I use a clipboard history thing, so I won't really squish it; it'll just push it down. Mm-hmm. But it's still a little bit weird. For regular people, I think it'll be fine if it works well. Historically, continuity has been weird and flaky. And if this is built on top of continuity, I don't know. But uh, many third-party applications have proven that this is something people want. They want to be able to copy on their iOS device and paste on their Mac. I find myself about to try to do it before I realize that I don't have any of those apps installed (laughs) and it won't work. Um, Like continuity, if this works... I will come to rely on it, but if it's at all flaky, I will just go back to pretending it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I'm really looking forward to it, though. It looked super impressive to me. I still miss PaySpot from way back in the day. Um, I'm hopeful that it works well. There, A few things that Apple has done today make me think they're really, really going all in on, all in on iCloud, which is bold. I mean, mm-hmm. the th- some things that are server-side <laughs> with Apple, like messages, seem to work pretty well, generally speaking. And the cloud kit based things that Apple's done, like notes, for example, seem to be working well, generally speaking. But I am I am very scared about having this all rely on some sort of server side. I'm assuming maybe not. Maybe it's only local, but I'm assuming some server side uh, thing on Apple's part. Well, no, the, the one I'm thinking of and the one I tweeted about when I said I'm scared, hold me, was the <laughs> the disk optimization. Like the idea is yeah. good that people run out of disk space in their Mac. They have no idea what the hell to do about it. And Apple can sell you more space in their iCloud drive thing. If they, you know, they'll transparently take your files and, and take the ones you haven't used in a while, push them up to the cloud and free up the space. And it will all be transparent to you. And you'll save a lot of room on your Mac. And like, this is basically automated cleaning that people don't do manually, which is all great. Like I'm all for this feature concept wise and implementation wise, especially if it's entirely transparent. Um, or, well, not entirely transparent. You would still want some way for people to know, did this file get pushed up to the cloud? Lots of people have expressed the idea, I want to be able to tell that it shouldn't push these files up to the cloud. Um, I don't know. Like, there, there are lots of pitfalls in terms of the implementation of this, but the real one is if it doesn't work, like, reliably all the time, or at least as reliably as Dropbox, then then it's just, like, a giant potential data loss button where you can turn this on and apple will selectively hose certain ones of your files <laughs> transparently in the background without you knowing and with, with no way for you to fix it so this is a feature that i look at and say i'm never turning that on like, right. <laughs> i'm terrified of this feature based on my past history of using icloud drive and the complete undebugability of it and the non-flexibility of it whereas Something like Dropbox is focused. It's a single folder. You can have selective sync. There are badges on all the icons through an official API that they support. I know when things are synced. I know when they're not. I can, I can, you know, I have a web interface to see, like, its version of truth. Like, all the tools available to Dropbox, even though they're, you know, fidgety or whatever, don't seem to be available in this. And historically speaking, Apple has not been as good and reliable as Dropbox and some other things about this. So, this feature really scares me, especially since it looks so attractive to people who are novices and just like, oh, yes, please take care of my storage for me. Yeah. If they turn that on and it just hoses everything, that's going to be a bad experience. How are you even going to recover someone from that? I don't know. This is Maybe I shouldn't be so pessimistic about this. Like Implementation-wise, it seems like it's a good idea, but there are so many places that from user interface to like reliability to performance where... It just seems terrifying to me. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, like an interesting thought experiment, I think, would be, you know, if if Dropbox offered this exact same feature, like, would you enable it? Like OS-wide, not just like yeah. in its Dropbox folder. Yeah. Would, it, yeah, would you enable it? I don't think I would enable it for Dropbox. Yeah, like, I don't think I would either. <laughs> and, and and Dropbox, I trust way more than things yeah. like iCloud Drive. Like, it seems like a good idea, but I think there are better solutions to this problem, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, tab, the tabs and windows thing, that seems like they're just like scraping the bottom of the barrel of like oh we added tabs to most things you know what we should just make this an official api that you get for free if you use ns document it's easy to implement and you can just mix windows together with tabs lots of applications have tabs it's nice to have a unified interface it's a recognition that tabs are as common 
as buttons and sheets and text input fields and combo boxes and all the other controls they have instead of having to roll your own tabs here's a standard control for you know not tabs as in the old style one where you'd switch to different like they, what is it called like the segmented control now it doesn't even look <laughs> like tabs anymore but those yeah, used yeah. to actually look like tabs back in the day but web browsers had the no each tab is actually the entire window and you can tear them out and combine them it's nice to see that be a system level feature they're kind of boring they look like safari tabs and i'm not sure safari tabs is the best implementation of tabs but uh it's a nice idea and i think you get it for free if you're uh an ns document subclass something yeah, like, like yeah that. i don't know the no. details but i think so i mean i, I think that's great I, I, you know as as a user of os 10 i mean i'm not really a mac developer but you know as a user of os 10 i think that's going to be awesome yep uh picture in picture not a problem I feel needs solving, but oh, not no, a bad I disagree. thing. I mean, yeah, for, like, pe- for people who use full screen, it's totally a problem that he's solving because full screen is like I would like to be full screen. That's how I work. I swipe on my pad from side to side, but sometimes I also want to keep my eye on the game. I wish they had more than one picture in picture so you could stack them up. <laughs> of course, you would want more windows. No, I mean, like, I, <laughs> that's right. I get, no, you got like, you got a, you got a uh, 5K iMac. You can have four games. Like they should be able to like tile them. The, the four football games from. Uh, uh, the ESPN app. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, I think it would, it would be, it'll be nice because, like, so often, I, I want to have like a video going from. Usually it's YouTube, or you know, some occasionally it's Vimeo, but usually it's YouTube. So I'll have this video going, and like, I'll want to move it to the side of the screen so I can do something else at the same time, or so I can watch some other window. And you have to have the, you know, if in, if you want to do that now with before picture in picture on the Mac, you have to have the entire browser Chrome around that showing mm-hmm. somewhere and kind of move the window in such a way that you like, yep. you know, you move half of it off screen and it's kind of it's kind of clunky now. So this will be nice for that too. Yeah, I, I didn't think about the full screen stuff. That's a that's a very good point. Um, well, let's see what else they do. Uh, the messages improvements, which we'll talk about in a minute, comes to the Mac as well. Um, I don't know. That's most. Oh, Apple Pay for the web, which is uh, kind of exciting. And I don't know. I think that was most everything. The big like flagship feature seemed to be Siri, which is uh, similarly solving a problem I don't think I have. But that that really deep contextual search does sound pretty interesting, and I am curious to try that. So even though they didn't announce it at this segment, this is the part where we should talk about the new file system because it is <laughs> it is only available on the Mac right now. It That's was true. not. It was not announced in the keynote. I found out about it after walking outside of the keynote when everybody else found the you know the, the updated WDD sessions to show the secret ones. And session seven hundred one was the one about the new file system. And then everyone found the developer documentation online. Didn't even get, as far as I'm aware, a, a note in one of the little word clouds. And that's mostly because even though there's going to be sessions on this and there's technical documentation, and it was announced in the State of the Union. This is not a feature of any of the operating systems uh, betas that they shipped, and it's not going to be a feature of any of the operating systems that, that they ship in final, except in experimental form. The new, op- the new file system will be for 2017, because as we all know, 2017 is the year of the file system. Uh, but they announced <laughs> it. They announced it now, and they're getting people working on it now. Uh, what the hell is the name of it? It's got a terrible name. APFS. Yeah, right? it's called AP- APFS. The A stands for Apple. The P stands for, stands for Pull. I guess. I don't know. P-U-L-L? I don't know. No, it's like Apple, like a... It's, it's Android, oh, Apple, Apple yeah. file system, and yeah, it should yeah. be AFS, but AFS is oh. Android file system, and IFS is probably also... Anyway, it's got a name. <laughs> it's, called, it's called APFS. Uh, it is only available on the Mac, and you can do a limited number of things with it now. You well, so far. Yeah. It will be on all the platforms right, eventually. Right. You can't boot off of it now. It has all sorts of limitations, all of which I assume are because like it's not done yet, right? And so this is how they're sort of testing the waters with it and letting people play with it. Um, yeah, I mean, they're also kind of like saving people from themselves here. Like, yeah. you know, it's not bootable and you can't time machine with it and stuff because they really don't want you to be installing a beta file system on your main drive and uh, with your only copy of your data. And you know people would do that if they didn't have these restrictions. Yeah, and it has a lot of interesting features. Almost all of the ones I would expect it to have. Uh, more than I more than I had hoped because I had heard things that made me think it wasn't going to have too much. First, it's Flash only. Yeah, which we expected, um, and that's great because it means they can optimize it for that case. Uh, it has cloning of files, uh, which is you would think it's just not just like hard links to files, but it's not because they're copy on write, so you can basically duplicate a file more or less instantaneously, and they will diverge slowly. Uh, part of that is uh, the same underlying technology. I'm assuming they're using for snapshots, which means you can take a point in time snapshot of the entire file system. You can, I think, you can clone an entire file system. I would assume. 
Um, you can revert to a snapshot, which they said is great for classroom, classrooms where they can just, you know, have the an initial state and let the kids use it and revert. It's also great for Apple stores. I'm, yep. sure, I'm sure they're all <laughs> loving it where they can, at the end of the day, revert all the demo devices to their previous uh, state. If you are a backup program, having a point in time snapshot to work out, which is great. And, you know, the fact that it doesn't work with Time Machine, it's because the new version of Time Machine is going to take advantage of all these features and be a million times better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. It supports extended attributes because it has to. Uh, and this this Apple documentation, we'll put a link in the show notes. It basically goes through like, here's why HFS Plus sucks in not so many words. And it goes through all the things like, oh, HFS Plus could do things where your thing was inconsistent on disk and has no atomic operations and things wouldn't be committed. So if the, something happened at this point, your thing could get corrupted. They try to be nice about it, but yeah. Uh, and the session description for 701 is, we're going to tell you why this file system is better than HFS Plus, which is shooting fish in a barrel, but it's... Uh, <laughs> It's better. <laughs> Fast directory sizing. You ever try to get the size of a big folder and it says calculating yeah, and calculating? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. they have a way to do that. Uh, you know, atomic operations, limited atomic operations. This is all great stuff. Uh, being able to make containers and put multiple volumes in the same container and having them all see that size. So like instead of partitioning, say you have 100 gigs, you can put three volumes on 100 gigs and they all look like they're 100 gigs. They're not. There's only 100 gigs of space and they're going to fight for it. But there's no, like, let me divide the 100 gig partition up into, you know, 50, 50 or 33, 33, 33. It's just, that's not how this file system works. Uh, it's, they could all share the space and then they will slowly accumulate into the space. It supports RAID 1, 0 and just, uh, you know, uh, concatenated volumes, you know, JBOD, where you just uh, take a bunch of disks and make one larger volume out of it. Uh, the only real thing it's missing, and I don't think it's something they can't add later, I hope, is any facility for data integrity at the file level to account for bit rot. So say you have a bunch of important files like your family photos and you keep them around and you keep copying them from disk to disk, how do you know that bit flip errors aren't slowly corrupting your files? The answer is for now at the file system level, you still don't. But this seems like a thoroughly modern file system and the fact that that feature doesn't exist now, I don't mind too much because all the other things they're doing it. It's like they're saying all the right things. (laughs) Everything in this documentation says modern, sleek file system that's going to enable UI features that are better. It will make Time Machine better. It will make backup apps better. It will make it easier to roll back to known good states. Like So many nice, friendly features can be built on top of this file system. This is what the world has been waiting for for a really long time. Still upset there's no data integrity, but because it's no mo- so modern, I see no reason they can't add that later for systems that can support the CPU, CPU overhead that that's going to add. So, as far as you can tell, so far, so good. Two thumbs up? Yes. No, I like it. I'm happy. The name is stupid. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> and, and the name is stupid and no data integrity, which is, which is, again, it's not a small thing. Like, when I've talked about it in this past, data integrity is, like, one of the biggest reasons I want a new file system. But all the other reasons are still super important, and it's just so great to see Apple finally moving on. And, and like Marco said, this is all platforms, from the watch all the way up to the Mac Pro that they never update. I like it. it's, the, <laughs> it's the whole... The whole line, they made a file system for the future that spans their entire product line, and which is exactly what you could hope for. And like, this is just the first version. Look at all the crap they added to HFS Plus. And in their old documentation, like, uh, we don't have, you know, on HFS Plus, extended attributes were tacked on. Wasn't that crappy? Well, here it's not tacked on. We thought of it from the beginning. It's a super important feature. Good job, guys. <laughs> so I am I'm excited. I am happy. I am optimistic. I am ready for 2017. Uh, real-time follow-up, by the way. APFS is optimized for flash slash SSD storage and can be used with tra- with traditional hard disk drives. Oh, that's interesting. That's I'm kind of surprised that they can even oh, do they, that. Well, they just did that because you can make like in the current uh, command line tools, you can make like an uh, an image, like a, a volume container image, like a disk image of it. I, I'm assuming hmm. people will screw with it. Oh, and one thing we didn't touch on is one of the current limitations is case sensitive only. I'm not quite sure what they'll do there because a lot of the Unicode normalization and case folding comparison crap in HFS Plus is a reason a lot of people hate it uh, because it's complicated and doesn't do what people expect. And it, it's kind of it's not non-deterministic, but it's it's complicated to know what it's, exactly it's going to do in terms of this is like when you name files. What what is the file name? And HFS Plus has really complicated rules about what a file name is, case sensitive or insensitive. This is case sensitive only for now. I'm assuming they will implement case insensitivity, but it's still, I think, an open question. Will they implement case insensitivity in the same weird way that it's implemented in HFS Plus? And by the way, HFS Plus on iOS is has always been case sensitive. 
I think so. For I'm mean, probably for performance and simplicity reasons. Yeah, like it, I mean, on, no one sees the file system on the phone, so it's fine. But yeah. case sensitive is simpler to implement, and if they do away with the file name normalization stuff, we'll put some show note links for Unicode normalization because we don't have time to explain it now. But if they either do away with that and just make it a giant bag of bytes and leave it up to the OS, that would be one easy enough solution. Or if they come up with a more streamlined, modern way to do their case folding for the case insensitive things and, and handle that. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure what they'll do, but a lot of the scary limitations are just because this isn't done yet. Uh, and this is only sort of a, a toy for people to play with on the Mac, but it will be rolling out everywhere next year. So I have uh, one other important question. So I, I do not have a ticket to WBDC. I'm, I'm going to layers. Uh, I was sitting in my hotel room streaming both the keynote and the state of the union with a handful of other people. And for the state of the union, it happened that uh, almost everyone in the room was a developer. And for the State of the Union, they said, okay, it's time to talk about the new file system. And literally everyone in the room, of which there were like six of us, all of them verbally at the same moment said, ding! As I'm sitting there watching the, the talk, people are on Twitter saying, oh my God, there was a ding. And I thought, oh, they, that's they funny. Heard you. They heard you in your room. Right. And I thought, oh, that's funny. Ha-ha. And, and then I realized, no, 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 these people are not being funny. There, there was a ding. Is that, a tr- is that true? Was there a ding in the room? There was a ding in the room. Did it come from the PA? No. Uh, interesting. But there was a ding. There was a ding in the room. Next up, let's talk about file systems. All right. That's magnificent. And I am very impressed. So I just want to put that out there, that someone had the wherewithal to either simulate or bring an actual bell with which to ding when when it was time to talk about the file systems did the person on stage hear it could you tell no, that that that's going to be cut out of the video first of all and second of all it's a big place i think the only people who heard it were the people who were in the proximity of the day i don't know some people on twitter were saying they were like second row or something like well, that uh, let's put it this way the reaction in the room shows that some people knew what the thing was about other people didn't know and didn't care well, but that's fair. The, but did, did you notice? Did the person, the, the the person speaking at the time, did they even notice that this oh, was no, happening? I don't, I don't think so. Anyway, I, 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 just want, I just want to say for the record, I did not make the ding. <laughs> well, God no. knows I didn't because I was in the All room. Right. Well, yeah. somebody spent eight dollars very well to make that ding. Approximately. Yeah, we, we assume. <laughs> so, I'm just saying I would never in- interrupt or disrupt a, uh, a live presentation by Apple in that way. No, of course not. You wouldn't. I would you, not. You I, would not I would not do that. Fair enough. Uh, anything else on MacOS? Oh, we forgot. One more on Mac OS. It doesn't support my Mac. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I completely <laughs> forgot. John has to get a new Mac Pro to run the new yeah. file system. It's amazing. So they, they stopped supporting my Mac, and I wondered why, and asked Marco, and he came up with what I think is the actual answer pretty much on the spot. Uh, why won't they support the 2008 Mac Pro, which is my model? They support the 2009 Mac Pro. They're 64-bit x86 machines. They're plenty fast. It's not like my machine is too slow to run uh, Mac OS Sierra. What's the deal? Why is my Mac not supported? Uh, and the answer Marco came up with, and then until I hear someone say otherwise, sounds like the answer is my CPU doesn't have the Intel like decryption focused instructions. I forget what they're called. You said AVX or something. I, I, I don't know. The, I, I forgot. It's like like the hardware uh, AES uh, yeah. acceleration and stuff like that. Like the Intel added instructions to the to the CPUs somewhere around that time. And I think you fall on the wrong side of that of that. Boundary. Right. And so the, a lot of the ARM, you know, the ARM system on the chips have these instructions. Uh, the, the modern x86 CPUs have these instructions. Uh, encryption, by the way, we didn't mention this for the Apple, new Apple file system encryption is built in, both vo- full volume encryption and also per file encryption, like iOS mm-hmm. uses. But this is built into the file system instead of built on top of it. Like you can totally tell this is a file system made for Apple's devices because these are exactly the features they need that they previously had to implement on top of the file system. Now they're built into it. You can run it without encryption. It's not like it requires encryption, but for the sake of simplicity of implementation, they basically said, uh, we're not going to put like conditional code and have a, 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 a have a code path that doesn't use. Uh, we're not going to like disable encryption on the 2008 Macs, and we're not going to say if you do the encryption, we'll do a second code path that doesn't use those instructions. They said, fine, just not support it. I mean, it's an eight-year-old computer at this point. It's totally understandable. Luckily, I have a 2009 Mac Pro at work, so I'll be okay there, and I'll be able to use it. But God. yeah, they stopped supporting my, my <laughs> Mac with the current version of the Mac operating system. So my, my 2008 Mac Pro was able to run every version of uh, Mac OS X and OS X, more or less. But not, well, I guess not every version, because 10.0 didn't have an x86 version. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you could run any of them until, what, 10.4? Yeah, yeah, until 10, until the, the x86 transition. Anyway, the yeah. whole point is my Mac is not supported, <laughs> and they did not release a new Mac for me to buy. Uh, so we'll keep watching on that front. 
oh god, I don't even want to think about. So the what are you going to do? Right. Like uh, you know, this fall when this becomes the new version, are you just never going to have the new version am, of OS ten? I'm going to install it at work, and I'm not going to install it at home, and we'll see how long that it, that remains tenable. Wow. I mean, by that point, they could have announced new Mac Pro that I order. I don't know, but it's not it's not an issue that I have to deal with for a couple months yet. And I love that this is like this is this is like the the roller coaster of Syracuse uh, keynotes. It's like you know you, you have like <laughs> amazing file system news. Like it, the, you know, no one expected a new file system to ever happen. Just like you know, when Swift came out, it's like Swift was I did. like. You, okay, yeah, but no one else. So, like, you know, you've been waiting for this for like forever. It finally happened, but also <laughs> they they're going, supporting my yeah, Mac. Also, they're going to force you to finally upgrade but, your but Mac that, Pro. But that's not bad news. That that's good news. All they got to do is make a new Mac. Like that's fine. Like they're again. I don't think there's. It's a perfectly valid decision to not support an eight year old computer. Like, <laughs> oh, totally. It, like it's fine. I'm 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 not upset about that at all. I it will be handled. No, so, I mean it's kind of uh, it's kind of amazing. It made it this far. Yeah. So, leaving aside hardware gripes, what's the next bit of low-hanging fruit? The file system has been conquered. Copeland's been conquered, or preventing Copeland 2010 with Swift has been conquered. What's the next bit of low-hanging fruit that you're really, really waiting for? I can fix the Finder. I mean, <laughs> then I can actually... the Finder? <laughs> oh, no. Don't, don't, don't get him started. No, no, come on. Let, let, you don't know what you're saying. Like, I got, the, finder <laughs> is the, one, the Finder is the one I kind of gave up on because it becomes less and less relevant to fix it. And, you know, so if they can make it irrelevant... It's fine. Uh, there are still many things that I wish they could fix about it. That's a whole other show. We can talk about it some other time. Um, that's, I mean, that's the big one from way back when. But if, if I'm forced to come up with an entirely new list, like, you know, I could still gripe, uh, complain about services forever. Like, I'm, I'm, don't worry. I will not run out of things to complain about. It'll be fine. <laughs> oh, no, Never. I know. I know you won't run out of things to complain about. But I am curious to hear what your top four complaints are these days. Oh. Uh, but anyway... <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Automatic, the connected car company that improves your driving and integrates your car into your digital life. For more info, go to automatic.com slash ATP and use code ATP0315 to get 20% off your purchase. Now, chances are your car has not kept up with technology because cars move really slowly. Automatic is a connected car adapter. It turns any car into a connected smart car that integrates with today's technology by just plugging in this little tiny adapter into the diagnostic board. It takes like seconds to do. Now, Automatic lets you keep track of your fuel mileage and your vehicle health. You can even see what your check engine light really means. So if you have some, you know, some kind of error code in your car, you just got to check engine light usually. Well, this can actually tell you exactly what's wrong. So you can tell whether you need to go to the shop and get this fixed immediately or whether it can wait a little bit. Um, it can also integrate with your Nest thermostat and all sorts of other services because it integrates with a whole app platform and if this, then that. So you can do all sorts of great stuff. You can do things like integrate expense reports for your trips. And of course, once you have if this, then that, IFTTT, you can get all sorts of crazy stuff to go on. You can have your Nest automatically turn on when you get home. You know, there's so many amazing things you can do with technology and your car. Automatic lets you do that. And all this is available with no monthly fees and no subscriptions. This is not a service that you're buying. You're just buying the device. No selling of data, no services, no subscriptions. You just buy the device, and that's it. No monthly fees. Now, normally, this device is 100 bucks. But when you use our special code, ATP0315, you will save 20% off that. So it's just 80 bucks. Go to automatic.com slash ATP for more information and to purchase. Use offer code ATP0315 to save 20% off the regular price. So it's just 80 bucks. Go to automatic.com slash ATP. Thank you for your support, Automatic. iOS 10. It's a thing. It's and iOS it, X, Casey. Oh, my bad. IOS, iOS X. That's, that's right. Uh, it's a thing. It looks good. It actually th- looks different. Uh, yeah, you it, it you has like talked a, about this earlier. Yeah, it, like they, they've refreshed the design like a, like a half step. You yeah, know? So that's like, well put. Like it's not like a total redesign of the system, but it's it's like a point five of like the of the iOS seven you know style design, which I like. Um, they they have made uh, many of the fonts a little bit heavier weight. Uh, they've introduced a new like super heavy bold uh, for San Francisco that's in use in in the news app and in music um, to really like massively draw attention to headlines, which I don't think I like, but we'll see. We'll see in use, uh, but. You know, overall, like all around the system, there's like you know little improvements to the text to make it a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier, a little bit more bold, so which makes it easier to read for a lot of people. Moving on from text, though, uh, the big change is they've introduced buttons. 
that look like buttons, <laughs> which is awesome. Like and, and windows that look like windows, like yeah, the, little, the little widgets. The, yeah, everything's you know. like now like these little rounded window like things. Um, which I I like this new style a lot. You know, I've I like this design. I like that Apple's moving it forward. I think this will prove to be more usable than like the pure iOS seven look, just because things are starting to have shapes again and text is starting to become more legible. And this is all good stuff. So I I, I think. You know, having not actually used the beta yet, uh, you know, we'll see how this is in practice. But tentatively, I give the design uh, improvements uh, whatever thumbs up that I can give. Yeah, the, the <laughs> lock the lock screen changes in particular are like mm. it's Apple finally not giving up on, but thinking better of like their attempt. They always wanted to say you can have an arbitrary image and we will display text on top of it in a minimal way that remains readable. And it's really hard to do that without deciding having an algorithm kind of like their itunes like album or thing like should we darken the background and use light text should we lighten the background and use dark text and what about they they love stuff showing through and like if it was all about usability you would say use an opaque light background with dark text on top of it that's easy to read like but they don't want to do that so they're creeping up on it so they said no we won't we're not even trying to mess with your background anymore we're going to put these white essentially windows on top of it and they're not opaque white you can still see stuff through them with the whole vibrancy like but it's just it's just more readable it's clear what the units are it's clear where they begin and end the text on them is easier to read because it is dark text on a light background always it doesn't depend on the thing that's behind it um and those are all those are all good decisions especially if they're going to add functionality to that screen which they are uh to make it a more straightforward ui and to give up on the dream of it being like this beautiful text that is laced onto your image like minimally as if it's just been <laughs> sprinkled there with stardust and in practice that what that translates to is hard to read can't tell what the hell's going on Yep, uh, and the lock screen now has widgets on it, and they actually literally use the word widgets, which um, I thought was a little surprising. Uh, yeah, it's I, interesting. They, what they basically did was they they took what used to be your Today View widget or your Notification Center widget, you know, whatever you call those things, and they're now kind of sticking those in more places. Which, mm-hmm. like, you know, I never thought it was worth Overcast having a, a Today View widget because because no one's going into their Today View right. to find out what's up with Overcast today. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, it's not. It doesn't. It didn't seem like it was that kind of app. And I personally never use Today widgets because uh, I don't look at my today view um so you know it but now they're putting those now on the lock screen they're putting those on 3d touch uh when you preview an app so now this is going to give way more apps a big reason to have notification center widget or to have these widgets you know now it's no longer notification center widgets right. it's no longer today view now it's just your apps widget and they can put those in more places and as both a developer and a user i'm looking forward to this this sounds great they did a lot of stuff with the lock screen to make it so that you don't accidentally dismiss it with the touch thing. I thought I saw mm-hmm. someone tweet that uh, maybe this is just the beta, but instead of uh, just placing your thumb over the touch ID to like to unlock it, that you actually have to press the button in. You can't just tap the touch ID to, to get through that screen. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, that, that, I believe that was Ryan Jones who said that. And I, th- yeah. I believe that's correct from what everyone. Else. It was kind of. It's kind of unclear as to like you know what sequence of buttons you have to hit or not hit to do that but that's roughly correct right and the whole thing where you don't touch any button just raise it up the table and it will show you the lock screen because they want you to do more on the lock screen there's going to be more information there hopefully you can customize it more uh and so they want a way to get to that without you accidentally unlocking it it's kind of weird that they have like designed out all the delays which are basically bad but that people had you know those delays had become part of the ui for people who were dealing with their phones and they don't want to put the delays back in because unlocking your phone real fast when you want to pick it up and actually use it is a great feature. But they still wanted to find a way to let you use your lock screen. So hopefully we'll be able to develop new habits and hopefully this sort of raise feature and pressing the button will work itself out into a situation where you can get into your phone as fast as possible but are never frustrated by accidentally getting into your phone when you really you want to work with your new fancy lock screen. Yeah. yeah. And this uh, this solves this raise to, to view or raise to wake, I think they called it. It solves a problem that I actually don't have because I, I am really good at hitting the side button in order to see my notifications, but I am the only person or, yeah. <laughs> or one of the only people I know that doesn't get annoyed by the way the new Touch ID works. And so this is clearly solving a problem for the overwhelming majority of people where, like you said, they, they mash down on the home button, suddenly they're right through the lock screen and they didn't get to see any of the notifications that they, that they wanted to see. And I do that occasionally. But generally speaking, I'm pretty good at avoiding it. What was interesting, though, and as a potential security issue, is you could interact with these widgets on the lock screen yeah. pretty pretty interestingly. Like you could respond to a text message, for example, right on the lock screen. So you're letting someone take your locked phone and respond as if they're you. Like right. I'm not quite sure. 
right. how this all works and out And it did not, this, what I'm about to describe was clearly not shown during the demo. But what I would suspect is if you ever have your phone and in, in, it's locked and you swipe up and go to the camera, take a picture, and then you want to go to your old pictures that you had taken previously, in order to do, or to send one, uh, in order to do that, it has like an interstitial, if you will, saying, hey, okay, enter your passcode or touch right. ID or what have you, mm. in order to perform an action like that. Uh, anything that's destructive or that involves something leaving the phone. I would guess that the same sort of thing would happen here, but without question, that is not what they showed during the demo. Yeah, and the same thing, speaking of the widgets, like of doing more stuff from the lock screen, the same kind of situation present uh, problem presents itself there. It's like, to make the lock screen more useful, you want people to be able to do more things, but to do more things or show more information, that shouldn't be on the lock screen. Like, I don't want to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Im- imagine... You had these rich widgets that could show you all sorts of contextual information about your day and things that have happened to different applications. Do you want anyone to be able to see that when they raise your phone? Like That's why on the Mac, a lot of the sort of notification center stuff says, hey, should this show on the lock screen or should it not? I'm sure the same things will be on iOS. Uh, but it's it's a type of granularity. Even I have trouble deciding, like going through each individual app and saying, do I want this to show on the lock screen? It's kind of useful. But then what if someone comes by my Mac and sees a message from my wife that's like floating in a corner in a box that I don't want them to see? You know, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's difficult privacy-wise, like... I think what Apple is creeping up on slowly, slowly, slowly is a screen on your phone that is not springboard, that is not the big grid of icons, that has a bunch of information that you can customize, that third-party apps can contribute to. I don't think the lock screen is that screen. I think that's another screen. Android users were telling me exactly what screen it is. Like, why don't you have real widgets that don't have to be the full width of the thing that you can customize and have sort of like a like a dashboard, if you will, for the phone that that you customize to contain all this information and that's not really the lock screen so i think they'll they'll arrive at that eventually but they're not there yet and right now they're just making the lock screen better than it was which i think is good yeah a couple other um quick hits and then then there's some other big ones uh maps looks improved uh the turn by or the turn by turn looked a lot nicer to me the traffic the, instead of doing the little dots it's like it's an actual highlight which looked better and you can zoom out without fighting with your goddamn phone just like squeezing <laughs> oh, the, how many times i fought with <laughs> oh. the phone with like seven fingers on the screen yep. stay zoomed out yep. so yep. i can yep. see oh. where the oh no it's the worst <laughs> yeah i completely agree with you um they also did a very cool thing which i think Waze are, has already done for years but if you're about to make a turn they'll zoom way 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 in and if you're not going to make a turn for a while it'll zoom way out which i really really like yeah it's nice um they also had some contextual stuff a lot of this a lot of today's announcements were about trying to invert context for many of the operations you're doing and that's not just limited to maps and that actually brings me nicely to siri improvements um they touted a lot of different siri improvements including a siri api And one of the things that I thought was most interesting about the Siri API was that they said without saying that this is all natural language and kind of implied that unlike Alexa, which I've not used to be completely fair, but I've understood to be, and I think one of you guys actually said it, to be very much like a command line. Yeah, I said that. Um, Exactly. So it's not, what, what Siri is, is not a command line. Siri is not just a command line where you have to do, you know, subject verb action or whatever the yeah, case may yeah. be. It's more uh, flexible in like the right. syntax that it accepts. Right. And actually in the state of the union when they go when when they went through the nuts and bolts about how that works from a developer perspective, one of the things they said in so many words was, "Hey, listen, this could happen th- this same command that you're trying to perform could be verbalized in one of six different ways and that's on us to figure out and to extract what the actual they had the different components of a siri command i forget what they are offhand but whatever those components are it's on us on apple to extract what those particular like the verb the subject the action whatever are and we will give that to you developers so that means it's on apple to parse out how exactly it is the user structures that sentence, which, assuming it works, is how I think it should work. But that's a big assumption. Well, that's what the intent system is about, and that's why it's limited to certain kinds of applications, I would imagine, is because Siri determines the intent uh, of, of, like, what is this person trying to do? And then creates a structured message for that intended action. So if the intended action is some kind of messaging, that's the one they showed, like, it's like, there's a recipient, there's the content of the message, and maybe a few other bits, and it gives the application that structured information. The application has no idea what you said. I don't even know who you can get at that information from the application. But because it's an application that says, I handle, you know, if someone, if the intent is to message somebody, that's a thing that I can do. So Siri will figure out, 
you're trying to send a message, you're trying to send it to this person, you're trying to send it with this app, and then we'll hand off to the app, here is the information, here is, here is the user's intent. They, want, they wanted to talk to you, WeChat or whatever, they wanted to send it to this person, and here's the message. And that's why you have to have structured, like, what well, can't be for all apps. Like, oh, I just want to make an app, and if someone says this, I want my app to do that. No, it has to be one of the intents that they support. I don't know how many different intents they support, but it's a limited set of, like, it's like six, five or six. Yeah, so it's right here. So they announced that the following are supported in Siri Kit messaging apps, VoIP calling, payments, ride booking, photo search, and workouts. And that's it. All, only yeah. those six. And, and each one of those things has a structure of the message that the application has to be ready to handle. And Siri handles the, I'll figure out what they said a bunch of crap. And what they mean is, I want you application to do this thing. And it's one of the short lists of supported things, which is. It's limiting because you can't say, oh, I had, I had a game and I want people to say, I want, you know, please foodle the blah, blah, blah you know, no, like challenge you, John at a game. Well, of- no, no, but, but even like something within the world of your, of your app, like, you know, uh, change armor, put on the good armor on character or whatever, like, you know, within Just speak an, some destiny. We won't understand. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. If you wanted to, that's not going to have integration with destiny, but yeah, like, like imagine something Yet. that it only made sense in the realm of your game. You can't support that because you have there in the Siri API, you have no, no facility to to uh, say what you want. You know, I want people to say this, and I want this to happen. That's not how it works at all. So this system is much more flexible, but also more limited, and it allows people to add Siri support without knowing anything about how Siri works or caring how it works or even caring that they use Siri because an intent can be expressed by anything. An intent could be expressed by a hand signal, by sending an email to yourself, <laughs> by putting text messages in, by waving your arm. Like, your application has no idea how the intent was expressed by the user. It is totally divorced from it, which I think is super smart, but it's also going to mean that the rollout of Siri is going to be limited. And I think it's fine for it to be limited, especially since the classes they chose are good, common classes of applications. I'm sure this will expand outward, just like extension points have expanded outward for the, thing, the places you can extend on iOS and on the Mac. Um, but it's, I, I think it's a very, very clever API, and it is better than let's just do the simplest thing, which you say a bunch of stuff, and you identify an application, and then we translate it to text and hand it off to your app, because that would have been a disaster. Yep, couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, like, the system as it stands now, like, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about it, because, you know, they didn't basically give me anything I can use for Overcast, because they didn't create or release one of these, like, intent structures, that is, play media item, yeah, or but, control control media playback in this app. A media intent is a gimme, though. Like, that's something they will, I feel like yeah. they will do. Well, it depends on why it's not there now. If it's not there now because they just didn't get to it, yeah. sure. If it isn't there now because maybe they wanted to protect Apple Music, I, I hope that's not the reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, I that there, It is possible that's the reason. I hope that isn't it. And knowing Apple, that probably isn't it. No, I mean, uh, they would want to control, like, if it was that was the case, you'd be able to have to talk to Siri to control all media playing in any of the native media controllers, right? Yeah, I guess. But, yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I, We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, because, like, right now you can say, you know, play this artist's name and it just plays it in Apple Music, and that's one of the big reasons why people choose Apple Music over yep. the over its I'm, competitors. I'm thinking like video services, like they're not competing with YouTube at this point, but well, there's still sort of. there's still no you know. But yeah, I mean, show, oh, show me the that. latest whatever video on the whatever channel on YouTube. Well, and they have that on the Apple TV. Like they they did add that to Apple TV to the Apple TV series yeah. where now you can you know YouTube is part of Apple TV's universal search, but, but not on iOS, and YouTube is on there as well. Anyway, yeah. it, like it, hopefully it's not a political reason, but yeah. technologically speaking, a media. Uh, media playback intent or even like something i don't know do they have like an email intent? i guess maybe that falls into the category of messaging i think it's messy i mean email is only for old people like us it's not yeah. like a lot of young kids are doing <laughs> anyway, anyway like this is promising siri finally has an api it seems like a reasonable good api that they expand out to new intents and by adding new intents i don't think there's any particular complexity they add it's just like the, the intents address categories not individual apps so they didn't yeah. pick select partners any intent that they add if they make a media playback intent they're not making like an overcast intent or a YouTube intent. They're going to make one that encompasses huge numbers of applications, just like they have with like the, the intents they have right now. So I think that the possible number of useful intents in the world is like low hundreds, you know, right? Um, and that will cover thousands upon thousands upon thousands of apps. Yeah. I mean, overall, like, I'm, I'm very happy with how they implemented this API. It I seems agree. like a very smart way to do it. It is, as you mentioned earlier, like, you know, because it kind of abstracts away dealing with the language uh, and some of the like some of the details of how the person structures their statement. Uh, it abstracts all that away for the developers. So, like, it's really easy to do things like like implement a messaging app because you don't need to like, you know, if you say, like, you know, send a message to John that I will be late. And, you know, if it's like, does the app need to know that I said that right. before I will be late? Or, you know, does it just get I will be late? 
and like you know, it's like, like it abstracts all that away. It deals with all that for you. That's uh, awesome. And then you can blame all the stupid bugs. I'm like, well, I don't have any choice. I get this. The intent sent me this. <laughs> yeah, it thinks yeah. the message is this, and if it includes that, we yeah. all just complain about Siri some more. Yeah, because and like that abstracts away dealing with so many you know language issues and different languages and different constructs, and so it, it's great for the developers that it supports and i hope in the future it supports more developers yeah i completely agree with everything you just said and and it's, i want to double down on what you said a second ago which is it supports like 30 some languages or something like that, yeah, which, something is, like that yeah. which is quite a bit different than most of the uh voice enabled stuff or certainly amazon's if not google's um there were a couple of other things that were mentioned that i'd like to try to breeze through pretty quickly because there was another big section in the ios stuff the quick stuff i'd like to breeze through is apple music got a refresh this was when uh bozeman st john came up i may pronounce that wrong but um she was awesome she was was, great there was one small part where she was trying to get a bunch of like completely nerdy (laughs) developers to try to uh sing or rap rappers to like with her that was part of the joke though in the end because like it was it was a long setup for realizing this is not happening right and you guys need to practice but it was uh, other than that which got a little bit cringeworthy i thought she did an unbelievable job and to my recollection the best first time performance of anyone i've ever seen on an apple stage yeah, like, like yeah, a, maybe one of my few tweets during the thing was like being cooler than eddie q is admittedly a low bar yes. <laughs> but she achieved it handily oh like, very cause, much because so. really i mean it's a tough call like it you want someone to be up there to show enthusiasm for music and it's hard to do that demo all the time. As someone snarkily tweeted, like, once again, Apple shows us how to enjoy music. Like, we all understand how to enjoy it. But, like, <laughs> but really, like, if you're going to do an Apple Music demo, you can't really demo it as, like, a series of screens and stuff. Like, the whole point of the thing is the music. And even though the message of this one was, like, you can find your stuff more easily or whatever, there's always going to be a part where they show enthusiasm for music. And you need a presenter up there who is clearly enthusiastic about it. And bottom line is you have to have someone who is relatable and uh, even though a lot of us are old in the audience, like we're, we can't relate to Eddie Q getting down. And I don't blame. It's not his fault. Like you know, well, a little bit. You can't. <laughs> everyone gets old, man. Everyone, everyone, be, everyone becomes uncool or uncooler than they were before. Um, and it was just a silly choice to have him up there doing that. Bring someone else who is better at this than you and who is more relatable. And they did. Hallelujah. Uh, and it was better. Yeah, I mean, like it's still a really tough gig because like that audience. Is, and that setting is really not conducive yeah. to like no. we're going to talk cool about music and mm-hmm. we're going to get all everyone all excited about our cool music like that's you know you can't do that in that room uh, but, no matter but, how cool you are but you can do it in, by being funny like craig killed it once again yeah right like he, you have to be relatable to that audience but you can do it like you can do it through humor you can See, do it through self-deprecating humor but i actually think that she was a different kind of funny like th- again that one cringe worthy part aside i thought she was a different kind of funny and arguably more funny than anyone else on stage and the thing that was so striking to me was the that she was a different kind of funny instead of the dad jokes that have been on yeah, Apple. That, that's all you can do if you're a dad right? uh, agree <laughs> agree that, that is that is the entirety of your repertoire but but it, it, in a way that i've never seen an apple keynote be funny her portion of the keynote was a different kind of funny and even as not a or even as a fellow white man like most of the people that were always on the apple keynote stages i really enjoyed this different kind of funny i thought it made for a better keynote yeah. having this different kind of voice and yeah. and i i really thought she did an unbelievably good yeah. job and the tri- as always the trick to being a good presenter is like you have to be comfortable with yourself and she was and it makes you like even even if your presentation doesn't go that well if you're comfortable with yourself and you roll with it that's that makes the audience more comfortable and if you can express genuine enthusiasm for the new thing that you're showing and like as for apple music itself they're trying to make it nicer to use by making it easier to find the stuff that you actually care about and addressing the idea of like, hey, I get on a plane and I have no idea what the heck is on my phone, right? So they addressed that directly yeah. and said, oh, now we have a special view. To, like, I feel like they're addressing, once again, addressing user needs that I feel like they should have known a year ago but didn't. Now they've discovered them. They've rearranged things a little bit. They've added a limited amount of features. Uh, is that enough to make Apple Music better? Is it still going to fight with people's metadata and give you bad versions of stuff and do all that like i don't know uh i hope not but apple music i still feel like that's the albatross around apple music's neck is uh for the people who should be the biggest fans of apple music music lovers who have huge music collections apple music i still think feels like the enemy because it's going to screw with your music in Mm -hmm. ways that you don't understand uh and it's like a giant beast to wrangle and you say no thanks as opposed to say itunes match which had the potential to be just as bad 
but it was not just as bad. That it would mess with your music in fairly predictable ways, and the upside was pretty big. Like so. Yep, I uh, still use iTunes Match and still love it. Yeah, if they if they cancel iTunes Match, that would be terrible because oh, I don't yep. want to use. Uh, you know, like we want like photos. We want we want the the photo style refresh. We're still waiting for the photo styles refresh of music. Apple Music is supposed to be it, but it's a bad job. Uh, we want all our music everywhere, and we want to control it, and we don't want Apple screwing with it and messing it up. So that's yeah. a perfect segue to the other thing I wanted to very briefly touch on, which is Photos. And basically, it was, hey, we're doing Google Photos, but we're doing it on device. And, <laughs> yeah. With and, no mention of Google any, anywhere, but that's that's expected, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, that's basically what I saw. And what I saw looked to me like it was taking all of the best bits of Google Photos, like arbitrarily searching for Handbrake or Controller, like they you didn't had done. Do that demo they didn't do the like they said hey we'll notice that there's water and there's animal Mm -hmm. they didn't pull up a search screen and say horses like i i continue to think that google will do this better obviously obviously i'm gonna do the controller test and by the way update on uh, we didn't have any follow-up in this episode but but uh small amount of follow-up once i uploaded all (laughs) once i uploaded all of my photos to google photo and i typed controller guess what it found exactly the controller picture the controller pictures that it had found before and also the ones that they just hadn't been uploaded yet so google photos totally aced the controller test it found <laughs> all my controller pictures and so that's going to be my first test with you know because all my photos are already uploaded to apple's photos you know in the cloud thing uh and when this feature rolls out as i assume it will on the mac as well i'm going to type controller and i can almost guarantee that it will not find it um so it's just a question of how much better is google with this than apple there was no demo we have no way to judge the fact that Apple is doing this at all is great. Maybe someday they can get family photo libraries. By the way, I was heartened by that. Speaking of family photo libraries, there is new sharing features in CloudKit that allows mm-hmm. like collaboration on notes and everything. I know something you can use this feature for, Apple. <laughs> you could have a single photos library for an entire family and share it among them so everyone's photos goes to one big pool. Yep. I, that was not announced. Um, maybe not this year or whatever. But anyway, or maybe that's maybe that's a fall event feature, or maybe that's a next year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be. Yeah. It, it scares me a little bit too. I'll see how well it works in notes. But anyway, yeah. the, the photos feature is like Casey said. It's like we're going to try to do things that Google Photos did. We're going to have the privacy angle, and that we're not going to do it server side. We're going to do it client side. How are we going to do it client side without hosing your battery? Presumably, they didn't say this. I feel like they should have. Oh, don't worry. We won't destroy your battery. We will do it when it's plugged in at night, and we won't start doing it until it's been plugged in for a certain period of time. We won't start doing it until you're above 80%. Like, that is, I assume, what they're doing, because I can tell you from seeing face recognition bring down many a Mac, I do not (laughs) want face recognition running on my giant 70,000 photo library. Even just the the bandwidth to download the originals, do the recognition, and chuck them out of storage again is just, you know. So I assume it will do this when it's plugged in. They're doing it on device instead of in the cloud because Apple is bad at cloud and because they love privacy. I hope they do a good job. No, they didn't demo anything to let me know they were going to do a good job, but uh, good for Apple for you know playing catch up once again. Fingers crossed. Yep. We are sponsored this week by Pingdom. You can start monitoring your websites and servers today at pingdom.com slash ATP. You get a 14-day free trial, and when you enter code ATP at checkout, you get 20% off your first invoice. Pingdom makes the web faster and more reliable for everyone by offering powerful, easy-to-use monitoring tools and services for anybody who runs a website or service. Now, by using Pingdom, you can, for example, monitor availability and performance of your server, database, or entire website from more than their 70 global test servers. They can emulate visits to your site to check its availability as often as every minute. So you can see, am I down in a certain region? Am I getting slow somewhere? Is my whole site down? Now, developers know Websites are becoming more and more sophisticated and are often made up of several dependencies. And when one dependency encounters an outage, it can affect the whole site. So it's also possible with Pingdom to monitor the availability of key interactions, such as contact forms, e-commerce checkouts, logging in, search functionality, and a whole lot more. Or just monitor the whole site, or both. Now, stuff breaks on the internet all the time. Every month, Pingdom detects more than 13 million outages, more than 400,000 outages every day. So regardless of whether your web presence is a small website or a complete infrastructure, you should really monitor its availability and performance. And I use it. I've been using Pingdom since 2007. That is a very long time ago. All they need is a URL to monitor. And you can check for, you know, you can check for a string on the page. You can check for whether it's up or not. It can alert you. It can do like high alert, like sending you text messages or emails or everything or push notifications on modern devices. Or you can have like a low alert where maybe it only emails you for certain less serious conditions. You can do so much with Pingdom and it's been rock solid reliable for me since 2007. 
When Pinduoduo detects an outage, you are immediately alerted so you can fix the problem before it becomes a much bigger and more costly problem for you. Now, you should not be learning that your site is down from people on Twitter. You should be the first to know so you can fix it before a lot of people see it. And you can be the first to know with Pingdom. Check it out today. Go to pingdom.com slash ATP for a 14-day free trial and get 20% off your first invoice with offer code ATP. Thank you to Pingdom, my favorite monitoring service that I've been using for way longer than they've been a sponsor. Thanks a lot to Pingdom for sponsoring our show. So uh, the other big thing on uh, iOS 10, to me anyway, was messages. And some of this made me feel like the old man I really am. Oh, I I think the entire thing shows that all of us, including most of the people in that room, are too old to understand why anybody would want to use these things. I totally understand. Like, I mean, (laughs) it amazes me that iMessage had been so boring for so long in light of every single other messaging application being having all these features having stickers and like uh, animations and snapchat child features annotations like apple had the tech especially like all the you know like making a picture and scribbling over like they have all the pieces there this is once again catch up where apple finally realized hey uh messages applications let you type text and emoji back and forth to each other are super boring and tons of people use other ones that uh, have all sorts of features like stickers and weird animations and like and now they're doing all that which is great again it is playing catch up but it amazes me that they spent so they know it's the most used application on their platform and they spent so long not even being able to send the messages in the right order and <laughs> have, them, have them deliver on all devices they didn't even mention anything about this and like the proximity thing so now if I have seven devices on my desk, will it not make all of them ring at the same time because it knows I'm there right, with my right. watch? Like, they didn't mention any of that. Like, Messages has been so far behind everybody for so long, and they caught they didn't catch up entirely, but a lot of the features they put out is like, all those things everyone else is doing, we are finally doing them as well. It would be nice if they were adding these features after making every other part of Messages, the boring part, exact, you know, rock solid and stable and like not annoying and presence notification and messages being on all devices and all times and working out all the privacy things but they're not they're going uh, ahead with these things and i think this is the, just the price of entry this is not like a radical feature it's like apple has woken up and realized if you have a message application you need to support these things and your message conversations will be as annoying as the people you or as exciting let's say yeah. as the people you message <laughs> with John was looking right at me uh, when he said that, FYI. Um, no, the, a lot of this looks really good to me. The emoji fi or whatever they called it, where you type text and then it will, I think, yellow highlight and underline individual words yeah. and give you not only the option of converting that word, say pizza, to emoji, but if you have something like, I don't know, girl, then you, if you tap girl, it'll give you several contextually relevant, hopefully, uh, options that you can t- convert uh, in the girl, the word girl into a different emoji. I, I feel um, like that is uh, not the way people use emoji a lot of the times though like 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 it's forcing a particular style because they and they said in the presentation that people will finish a sentence and want sort of an an emoji capper like that's how people a lot of people use emoji is sort of like to express something after you've written the text going back into the text and replacing the nouns with emoji yeah people do that sometimes but it's not as common in my experience as or or at least you'd want it in addition to have a thing at the end and what i want to see is more like slacks autocomplete where you enter emoji mm-hmm, autocomplete mm-hmm, mode, mm-hmm. you want to find this that right emoji capper. Yeah. That's what they said in the demo. But you didn't find the emoji capper. You just went back in and changed a bunch of nouns to emoji, which is a good feature, and you should have it. But you should also have a way to you know quickly sort of inline autocomplete emoji uh, in, in the in the message. Anyway, maybe I that's mean, version. It still makes sense to me though because. It's considerably faster to type words than to scroll through that damned emoji list trying to find the right emoji. So it made sense to me. Uh, Speaking of of writing, you can write with your own handwriting, kind of like on the watch, but better, uh, which is exciting. You can do the same thing that Google Google showed where you can make the text that expands and shrinks. But I think you pointed out, John, that it will land and its its resting state is full size text. Is that what we talked about? Like a lot of things, a lot of the things we saw demoed are exactly what uh, Google demoed and it's aloe thing. Uh, Like, you know, down to the whispered and shouting and the, the the bigger emoji and all the other stuff. Only Apple did some of them better. And the whisper is a great example. If you want to be like whisper and have tiny text, you can do that. But it stays small just for a second and then comes back to what I assume is whatever the normal size is. So if you have your font size cranked up on in iOS for accessibility, that your whisper will start up microscopic for a second, get the effect, but then it you know it doesn't stay that way. It goes it goes large again. Yep. Uh, one of the things I like most, and I can't. 
I can't verbalize why, but I really liked Invisible Ink. I thought that was really, really cool because it's like, hey, I'm showing you something that's they're, – they're both shaking their heads and laughing at me right now. But, but it, it, if you're showing you, something that – You like that, the worst stuff. I, I, hey, you no, know, it is what it is. I, I think it's cute. I think there's an emotional aspect that, right, that, exactly. that, that, that works. But here's the thing that, that worries me a tiny bit about it. Invisible Ink, the feature, makes – people's phones act exactly like the crazy haunted gadget that some people believe their phones are <laughs> <laughs> like so the first time you send this to somebody who doesn't know what this is they're gonna be like oh i've got a virus my phone is haunted the letters are all scrambly i can't see anything ah, um i'm sure they'll get over that and you'll explain it or whatever i think it is a good feature it's a clever feature it is another feature that will confuse people who are less savvy then eh, maybe the especially I, since it's not obvious what you're supposed to do with it when you know it's not obvious that you should swipe it to make it go away right so yeah, that's fair and it looks yeah. exactly like what people think bugs look like in like movies like <laughs> oh i've got a bug in my thing all the text is all scrambly the aliens are into it well, it looks <laughs> like it looks more like sand is covering it but i mean your point is still fair um it, it seemed to me like the, the new messages is a combination of um, Slack with the responses on individual uh, lines, which I didn't, yeah, like, I never caught like, how you engage that, but you can like thumbs up an individual message that like, somebody it's, else it's like sent. like reactions, do you think? Or yeah. Is, or yeah. is that, or is that, like, that, that like flagging for your own purposes? Do they see your thumbs uh, up? My, I think they do. Yeah, yeah, my impression was that they see it very much like the way Slack works if you happen to have used, used Slack. And I like that a lot. So, you know, the example they have on, on the introduction to iOS 10 page and they call it tap back uh so here you go just tap to send one of six quick responses that let people know what you're thinking and so they have an example of somebody saying head to santa cruz question mark and then the tap back is a little thumbs up and that's actually really convenient because yeah, that's it, nice especially if you're like on the go you can just basically say yes i acknowledge what you've said i agree right. with it let's do it we're good rather than having to write out a text message so it's a combination of slack uh snapchat uh, i jokingly celebrated uh, during the keynote that i don't have to learn how snapchat works anymore because because it seems like a lot of those features have come uh, oh, into this iOS. Is, this is way more limited than Slapchat. Oh, absolutely. It's like, I, like I tweeted, it's baby slap. Snapchat. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it it's really Snapchat is. for parents. Yes, which makes it perfect for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, some no, of this, yeah, it's, some I mean, of this like, stuff is also a little weird, like the uh, let's celebrate. Say things like happy birthday or congratulations with animations that take over the entire screen. And you can have like bubbles fly yeah. or balloons, excuse and me, fly con- up. And confetti and fireworks. Those, yeah, all, look, they sure those, locked, those all look really good. Uh, they sure locked underscores confetti. I was very yeah. sad Well, about I mean, that. I think uh, some of that stuff again it's going to be the kind of thing like series jokiness where like it might be cool the first time you see it but yeah. like there's only a very small handful of these like canned effects so mm-hmm. it's they're going to get old quickly i think and and i think some of them seem a little heavy-handed you know yeah, also, I overall i i think it's it's a cool it's a fun little feature to have but i do think their implementation of it is going to is going to get uh, uh, I think a little a little annoying but, pretty quickly. But the same is that's that's what how you view it. But it's True. a nice thing to have. But like this is how entire groups of people communicate all the time yep. with the same yep. limited palette of stuff that you would find annoying really quickly. But as far as they're concerned, anything that you can't do this with is crap, and they never get tired of it. Like never meaning like yeah. you know, all right, like, that's fair. Like it just I mean if I scroll through like my kids' conversations like. Their, their tolerance for repeated and they don't even have they have an even smaller vocabulary now and they're still just repeating it and everything like i think this will like it's not how we will communicate but you have to have this and yep. you have to have even more of it and they will not burn out on these things they will just keep using them and potentially abusing them i just hope they don't crash the app because that'll be a shame um, well <laughs> and to that end they're now there's now an app store for uh iMessage, which in principle, I'm all I'm 100 percent behind, but in execution, uh, mm. a little scared. I mean, people yeah. are already doing that with buying like the keyboards, like Kim Kardashian keyboards. Right, to do right, that. Like, right. like this is already they're responding to a market. And again, it's not like Apple is uh, like, oh, we are the pioneer. They're catching up. Like this is a thing that people do on all platforms that they're finding a way to do through keyboards on Apple's platforms. This is what people want to do with their phones. It may not be what we want to do with their phones, but they have to provide a way to do it, even if yeah, even if it's outside the realm of like if Steve Jobs was still alive today, what would he think of this? Probably not up his alley. Probably he would want things. Oh, he to was be... a sucker for like kitschy animations. And stuff. Right. He would love that kind but, of stuff. But I think I don't know if he. I think he might draw the line of like the sticker stores. And, yeah. And well, like... but you know, I think one thing that's interesting, like a theme we saw throughout this. You, it, you know, you look at like things like the integration with other services into your contacts, mm-hmm. so you can like you know write in your address book or your contact app. You can see like, all right, you can call this person on WhatsApp or whatever. I don't know how these. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a phone call service ever or just, just messaging? Just do Skype. Just <laughs> yeah. use Skype. So yeah. So now you can do that. You can you. 
you know, they have like all these little hooks everywhere that, you know, that are slowly adding more places where third party apps can hook into the system and, and appear native. If you if you look at something like Android or Windows, you know, where things are but more Android really, things are kind of like the Wild West and there are lots of ways for apps to hook in all over the place or to be everywhere, but it's it's done in like a very like Wild West kind of, you know, risky or or unstable or just kind of messy way. What what Apple has done with iOS is slowly make a system over time in which you can integrate and when you integrate, it's as nice as the built-in stuff. And they are doing this like very slowly over like a decade. But the result is so different from what you get on Android. Where on Android, like you could do way more, especially back in the day on day one, you could do way more. But it, it resulted in overall, I think, a less nice system than what we're slowly developing on iOS. Where now you can integrate all sorts of cool stuff. You can integrate, you know, certain kinds of apps in many different places all around the OS and make it seem just like the first party integration, uh, but without many of the downsides of the Android style kind of more Wild West system. And without the downsides of the Apple approach, which is uh, okay, you can have some integrations, but when you say uh, ask Siri to contact somebody or pull up some UI, we're always going to show you ours first. Like their whole right. the pitch was, oh, but if you f- if most of the time when you talk to this person, you do it through WeChat, that will be the first choice. Like we won't say, oh, well, okay, well, you could add that extra integration, but that's a frill. When you contact them, by any pro way programmatically will always present you with the Apple ones first. And this, this ties in with the ability to delete the built in Apple apps and the potential, I don't know if this is confirmed yet, ability to pick different default apps for things. Do we know yeah, anything so about that? so hold on really quick. Before we get to that, I just want to say that I am all in on the me- on the messages stuff. I'm really excited about it. And during the State of the Union, I forget who it was, but they were talking about the sticker pack specifically, and they were mm-hmm. saying, oh, here, look at how easy it is to build these. You do need Xcode, but bi- but whoever it was, they, s- they started Xcode, did a new project from this new template, and they said, okay, I'm almost done. Literally, all they have done was made a yeah. new project. You just then, like drag in the images, right, yeah. and exactly. that's about it. Like, there's yeah. no code. Like, you can make a codeless sticker app, <laughs> which is really exciting and impressive, and I'm really hopeful about that. But I'm also very scared that that's just going to be spam yeah, city. If, if you want to, s- you can sell images. Like, I'm sure people will just upload pictures of Star Wars stuff and try to sell them until uh, Lucasfilm. Yeah, know, or whatever. it's going to yeah. be a copyright infringement nightmare. Yeah. Right. So, I uh, leaving messages behind. I'm really enthusiastic about it. Some things I don't totally understand, but I think it's really great. Uh, what John is alluding to as summarizer in chief is some people have noticed that you can actually delete like the stock mail app that comes on ios yeah and they're like in the app store now yeah, if, <laughs> right. if, and if you want to get it back how do i get it back go to, the, go app to the app store, store hit the little cloud with a downward facing arrow and I there's can. been no official uh, documentation or talk about what that means but it could potentially mean and it seems like it means that you can get a different default mail app we're not 100 well, percent sure about this you know like, well but so say you delete the mail app do you have no way to send mail? Does the mail share sheet not show up anymore and that's their solution? Right. Or like, you know, what happens like if you ask Siri for a certain feature that right. requires like, you know, if you delete the weather app, can Siri still get the weather? There's stuff like that. Yes. Or like they're like the system has been built for so long to assume that these certain apps are always available. Right. So it'll be interesting to see like how they handle all this. I mean, whether we're gonna get the ability to change default apps, I think is a totally separate decision that like we can we can have this system that only exists so we can delete the tips app. You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, let's say you like tap a mail link in, well, a, in a way, in a mail to link in a web view. Yeah, right? I, I there's just like tell no you, handler. Well, no, I'd say th- there's an alert. So there's a tweet by Mike Zornak, who and we'll put this in the show notes, and it's a picture uh, that he said he got from a mail to link, and it says restore mail question mark. You followed oh, a, a link crappy. that requires the oh, app no, mail, which is no longer on this iPhone. You can restore it from the app store. But that's crappy. Like we're it's a half solution. Like yes, it's great that we can delete the tips app. Like it's all, we're all for that, right? But if I delete mail, like the share sheet, we already have a solution to. If I delete mail and I go to to share a, a link, the Gmail share thing will be there. Good. We're all set there. But the default comes in when, oh, I tap a mail to link. Then what happens? It's nice that it's not an error or nothing happens and it, it gives you a button to fix it. It would be nicer if we said, hey, I deleted the mail app for a reason because I don't use it to do my mail. Let me tell you which one I do use to do my mail. And then you come up with a protocol or an intent system or whatever that says yeah. make the Gmail app conforming with this and it can replace. And maybe they have that planned. But, you know, it could be that that dialogue is coming up because we have not detected any other application on the system that can handle the mail intent or whatever. And therefore, we have to bring this dialogue up. Whereas when you learn about this new API in a session later this week, you can make the Gmail app be a stand in mail application because that's part of it. You have to to be it to fulfill the role of a default web browser, mail client, messages client, or whatever, you have to be conformant with whatever way the system 
communicates to you? How does it launch you and say you're now supposed to be composing a message? The mail app does whatever the hell it does and the system integrates with it. Once it becomes open to third parties, that has to be formalized. So I would say that that dialogue doesn't tell us anything yet other than Mm -hmm. no current applications Mm -hmm. are able to be the default mail application. I still hope that we will learn that there's an easy way for them to do that, and that would be great. Yeah, we'll see. Um, We are pretty much out of time for now, but before we go, Marco... How do you feel about the keynote and the State of the Union, which we didn't get to talk too much about? One thumb up, two thumbs up, two thumbs down. How do you feel? Overall, I think two thumbs up. We're going to see, you know, the, there's a lot of stuff that there's still the question mark of like, well, if that really works well, it'll yeah, be great. I think or, there is a lot of that. Or like, you know, we're kind of guessing how certain things are going to be implemented. Um, so as we find out more about the details of these things, obviously, you know, my opinion might be refined. But overall, I'm very happy with this. And overall, I think it's really good. I mean, they're... There, you know, there were some things that we were hoping for that we didn't get, but I think we got a bunch of really big stuff. It's going to be really nice. So overall, for me, two thumbs up. John? I really like that, you know, so they, they pre-leaked basically no hardware, so that prepared us for that, which is, again, disappointing, but, you know, fine. I like that in the absence of hardware, they now fo- – they had a four-platform structure to, to focus on, and they took us through each of the platforms, and – the kind of the good keynotes, especially about software, are the ones where you find yourself saying, finally, yes, that thing, that thing that's been annoying me, <laughs> yeah, you point. have addressed mm-hmm. it. And every single one of the sections had things that were all like, yes, good, finally, I am excited to do that. That has annoyed me for a long time and you've solved it. Or I'm excited that you recognize, like, it's fun to see them recognize a problem, like with the watchOS thing, that they didn't just say, oh, and we tweak things to make it a little faster. It's like, we 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 feel your pain. We understand we didn't do a good job. We're taking another run at it. And, of course, the biggest, finally, of all, the file system, which I'm <laughs> so tickled that they pre-announced, <laughs> even though it's still not coming in 2017. Uh, until 2017 is exactly what I talked about last week. I am super happy about that. Um, and I guess we'll just all wait patiently for the hardware that's going to replace my now unsupported Mac Pro. <laughs> no, I think two thumbs up. Uh, I thought it was really good. The only problem I had with the presentation was the thing I was most amped about during the keynote was the watch stuff. And so not that it was downhill from there, but I thought that was the most impressive <laughs> stuff it, of everything. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just not I don't enjoy the file systems as Casey, much as you do. They, but. they revamped emoji for you. Well, OK, <laughs> they put yeah, emoji that's everywhere. Point. That's for a good you. point. That they made them three point. times bigger. And yeah. they did, all right. Fine. I tell you, you're right. You're right. That, I, feel that like I'm on top four. I feel like I'm on top four again. You're arguing with me, but you're right. Uh, so, OK. <laughs> But no, no matter what, I still land on two thumbs up. I thought it was really, really good. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Although I completely agree with a little bit of what each of you said. I completely agree, Marco, that it's a lot of assuming this works. Right. But we have no reason to believe it won't. So, so far, so good. And I agree with what John said about, oh, finally, this is a thing. Finally, this is fixed. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. You nailed it. That I mean, And that's, that's like a, a mean way of saying they had things that people liked. They announce things that people like, lots and lots of things that people like, big things, small things. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. But it like it didn't feel like they were lacking in any of the platforms. There were tons of things that, uh, you know, good things. We just had an episode where it was like WC is not Santa Claus, but they still bring a lot of little gifts. Like, you know, I mean, that's not how presentation is supposed to work. And like Marco said, we could unwrap them and there's a dog turd in there and we'll see. But. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but for now, we're Actually, like, there are many great gifts. If something is for everybody under this tree of WWDC, and in a way, the hardware, getting the hardware out of the picture just stops us from talking about hardware, and we're just like, all right, all of your platforms have new, better things. That's, that is the, this is the blessing of waiting all year and holding all this stuff and holding it in for one big burst, that is that we get to be cranky right up to the point of WWDC, and it's like, oh, they did have a bunch of nice stuff for us. Actually, I think, John, if we've learned anything from today, it's that if it is a dog turd that's on, that's in that, that gift box, it's actually a dog turd emoji at three times the size. <laughs> <laughs> and it's happy. And it's a very happy dog turd. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot to our sponsors this week. And thanks for all the live listeners for who tuned in. We had uh, 925 live listeners Holy today. Holy crap, seriously? <laughs> yeah. So that, wow. might, that might be a record for us. And uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll cover a lot more this next week. Uh, so we'll talk to you then. Thanks a lot. Now the show is over They didn't even mean to begin Cause it was accidental Oh, it was accidental John didn't do any research Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental Oh, it was accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter Follow them at C-A-S-E-Y-L-I-O.
S S, so that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T, Marco Arment, S I R A C U S A Syracuse. It's accidental. All right, thank you, live right. people. That's very kind of you to tune in, and I'm sorry we weren't in the chat room, and uh, I'm sorry we're basically hanging up on you, but uh, we got to go. See you later. I can't believe this worked. Yeah, me neither.